So I want to acknowledge, uh, as always, but with um, great um, respect and humbleness for the land that we're on, that we're hosting this session on the unceded and ancestral territory of the Coast Salish peoples. That includes the territories of the Musqueam, the Squamish, and the Tsleil-Waututh nations, as well as the Métis Chartered Community of the Lower Mainland region. And all of you, wherever you are in the province or anywhere else on in this uh, nation, uh, are uh, hopefully respecting and caring for the land that you are on. Next slide. So today it gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Darren Ewan. Darren is a clinician, scientist, and a staff nephrologist and associate professor in the Faculty of Medicine at, at the University of Toronto, based at uh, St. Michael's Hospital. Um, his research group um, based there uh, is, is uh, quite diverse and includes young investigators, one of whom was intended to uh, present today, but Darren will tell you more about that. And he's had an extensive career focused on developing new diagnostics and therapeutics for organ fibrosis. Uh, he's a clinical transplanter uh, and uh, an avid uh, researcher, uh, translational and otherwise. So Darren, without any further ado, uh, welcome to British Columbia virtually and uh, over to you. Okay, so um, thanks so much for the kind introduction, um, Adira, and, and also for the, um, the land acknowledgement. Um, so I hope everyone can see my screen. Um, please let me know if you have uh, troubles uh, seeing anything, but uh, hopefully- it Not yet, can't see the screen. Oh, that. you know, because I probably there, need to share it. That's it. <laughs> that would be important. Um, okay, so firstly, thank you very much for the, um, for the invitation to speak today. Um, let me just make sure I got, hopefully now it will be okay. It's all okay? Perfect, perfect. Okay, so yes, yeah, so thank you very much for that kind introduction, Dira. Um, I'm uh, really honored to have this uh, privilege to share this, this work in progress that uh, is unpublished, but we're hoping to submit shortly and also to, to translate to our our patients um, with diabetic kidney disease. Um, and I'm, I'm really a representative, as Adira mentioned, of a, a much larger group of people um, that form um, the Precision Medicine in Diabetic Kidney Disease um, initiative that's been funded by CanSolve CKD. And in particular, um, as I'll mention to you, um, my co-speaker was unfortunately not able to make it today due to unforeseen circumstances that he could not um, get around, um, but uh, really the work is mostly his. Um, so I should mention um, that I, uh, as my disclosure, that I am a scientific co-founder and consultant for a company called Fibercore Therapeutics, which is a spin-off company um, that is focused on developing new anti-fibrotic drugs for kidney diseases and, and other diseases as well. Um, the most important disclosure, as I, as I already mentioned, is that I, I represent a team of people. This is by no means anything that I could do by myself. Um, and so I should want to acknowledge a few people up front and then uh, the rest of the people um, at the end. So firstly, I wanted to highlight Kevin Burns, who I think many of you know, who is a nephrologist in Ottawa, um, and Richard Gilbert, who is an endocrinologist at St. Michael's Hospital. Uh, they were the two people who had the initial idea to propose this precision medicine um, proposal to CanSolve CKD. Uh, and they were also um, nice enough to allow me to uh, take over the leadership in the last few years um, as I became very interested in the project, but they're still involved. And as I mentioned to you before, this work is actually mostly, almost 100% done by uh, Paresh Nisra, who is an extremely talented uh, young nephrologist who finished his nephrology fellowship training in Toronto um, a few years ago and is currently doing a PhD, um, co-supervised by myself, but really supervised by a uh, talented scientist named Christina Nostro. And I think I just want to highlight... Um, uh, especially for the trainees, this is an amazing story in that his thesis for his PhD has nothing to do with the work I'm going to present to you today. Um, he is actually looking at um, uh, developing HLA deficient beta uh, cells for treatment of diabetes. Um, but when the pandemic hit and institute closures occurred, he pivoted and started working on the CanSolve CKD uh, work and has continued this even on the side, uh, despite the um, um, ability to go back into the lab. So a really amazing um, story and uh, tribute to his hard work. Okay, so I have two main objectives for today's uh, talk. Um, the first is uh, to recognize that we actually know very little about the pathogenesis of diabetic nephropathy. We see it all the time in our clinic, clinics and on the wards, um, but we actually, when you think about it, don't really understand a lot about how diabetic kidney disease develops and progresses. 
Um, and I also want to share you uh, share with you some exciting new um, advances that have allowed us to actually look into the pathogenesis of diabetic kidney disease. Uh, and certainly we are not the only group. There are many groups that are taking advantage of these technologies around the world. And so I think this offers new hopes for new diagnostics and new therapeutics um, for this uh, very important problem. And we're already starting to see some of that um, uh, come out uh, in the last few years. So before we dive into the weeds, we, let's take the 30,000 foot view of, of this, the problem. So, you know, we know this as nephrologists and as ne um, trainees interested in kidney disease, that diabetic nephropathy is a common problem. This is data from the US, but I think is equally applicable to Canada, where we have the number of incident cases of ESRD plotted on the y-axis in thousands, and then time on the x-axis. And we all know that diabetes is far outstripping um, the other top common causes of uh, end-stage renal disease. This is a huge problem that we see all the time. Um, and yet, I think we also recognize that diabetic nephropathy is not just one disease. It presents in many different ways. This is um, taken from a review uh, published by Andre Korlewski in Diabetes Care in a few years ago, where he just looked at the rate of GFR loss in various different patients. You can see each patient is a box where GFR um, is on the y-axis and time in years is on the x-axis. And what you can see here is that um, some people can remain very stable over time. Some people can have uh, very slow rates of loss, maybe more moderate loss, and some people can have a very steep loss of GFR. So diabetic nephropathy doesn't present necessarily in one single way. So we have to have measures to predict what we would call bad disease, people that we should really be worried about when we're seeing them in clinic. And, you know, I, I've seen this schematic. I think this is the one I was presented to in medical school when I went um, uh, to med school. Um, and it presented the classic way of thinking about diabetic kidney disease and pretty, pretty much highlighted um, two important risk factors that we thought were important. Uh, so the development of proteinuria or albuminuria and hypertension. And I couldn't put this on the graph here, but obviously glycemic control. And so we think that someone who has poor glycemic control and A1C of 12%, very hypertensive and um, significant proteinuria would be someone who is at high risk of progressing. And certainly that's true in many cases. And so this is an example of a patient that I um, took from a paper from 1994, Richard Gilbert was a co-author on, where creatinine clearance is plotted on the y-axis as well as albumin excretion rate. The um, albumin excretion rate is in the black dots and you can see there's a big rise in, in, in albuminuria over time. This is a logarithmic scale on the, on the right. And then on the clear circles, you can see there's, there's a drop in creatinine clearance. So this would be the so-called typical patient that we see with uh, diabetic nephropathy. But I think we also have to recognize, and I'm sure you've all seen patients like this, that diabetic nephropathy patients don't always follow the textbook, which is to say that you don't have to have high-grade proteinuria to develop progressive GFR loss. So here's another example of a case identified back in 1994 where the proteinuria is seen in the black dots remains low and stable over the course of around 20 years. And yet over that same 20 years, there's a progressive loss of creatinine clearance. So you don't have to have albuminuria, you don't have to have a bad hypertension, um, and you don't necessarily have to have very, very bad glycemic control, and yet you can have progression. And so what this tells us is that our ability to predict high-risk patients is actually maybe not as good as we'd hoped. But if we take a step back, we have to think a little bit about the definition of risk. Um, and so for, for kidney disease patients, I think probably one of the most important outcomes that one can have is kidney failure, meaning the need for dialysis or transplant um, to go on living. And so when I talk to my patients about kidney disease, I like to use this analogy of walking towards the edge of a cliff, where when you fall off the cliff, you need dialysis or transplant. And so one of the obvious people that might be someone considered high risk is the person who's standing at the edge of the cliff. And the edge of the cliff is the person who's standing with an EGFR of around 16 or 17 mils a minute. He or she is just at the verge of requiring dialysis or transplantation. These are people who I would call advanced stage disease. Now, risk though depends on perspective. You could be this person back here with a GFR of let's say 50 mils a minute, but you remember that really rapid progression. If you're going to lose that 50 mils a minute in one year, you're sprinting towards the edge of that cliff. And that means that 
this person could also be considered to be high risk as well. Um, and I would call this active disease rather than advanced stage. Uh, and this is important, um, I think, because in nephrology, or at least for me, uh, I always think of that hard outcome of needing dialysis or transplantation. And when you think of large clinical epidemiologic studies, that is the, the data that is most easily accessible. It's much harder to have rate of GFR loss as a measure of active disease. And so when we look at risk of kidney failure, we kind of conflate these two things because you can either have people that can be at high risk because they have advanced stage or people who are high risk because they have active disease regardless of what their baseline GFR is. And so I think we need to tease apart this concept of stage versus activity, which at least for me, I had not really thought about in the setting of diabetic kidney disease. And yet we think about this all the time when we see patients with cancer. Our oncology colleagues have uh, talked about this for many years. When we take the example of breast cancer, um, we are very commonly talking about disease stage. And we also talk a lot about disease activity. We know some uh, types of breast cancer are much more aggressive than others. So why are oncologists thinking about this and nephrologists are not necessarily? And I would argue that it's par partly because of the oncologists taking advantage of technologic advances that we have not been doing in, in nephrology for various reasons. And one of those is the ability to profile within tumors their gene expression. They know, the cancer doctors, which genes are turned on and which genes are turned off. So if you go back 20 years, um, uh, you look at the textbooks and say, how is breast cancer categorized? Well, it was categorized based on the microscopic appearance. What did it look like under the microscope? It was described as ductal cancer, lobular cancer, other types of cancer, inflammatory cancer. Uh, and that was it. And that's kind of the way I think we are currently when we think about diabetic kidney disease. But of course, that's not the way we think of breast cancer now. We talk about the presence of hormone receptors, the presence of HER2, the absence of those things, triple negative breast cancer. And we know that confers different prognoses and also it informs different types of treatment. This is taken from a review uh, a few years ago about how to manage breast cancer. It's not about ductal, lobular, inflammatory. So in transcriptomics has revolutionized the understanding of how breast cancer is thought of, and actually that's led to concrete uh, changes in prognostic and therapeutic discussions. And yet when we go back to nephrology and we think about the standard approach to diabetic kidney disease, it's very much like that ductal or lobular discrimination. Uh, we use demo we often don't biopsy our patients, so we use demographic and clinical parameters. Uh, my good friend and colleague was Anav Tangri um, was instrumental in developing this kidney failure risk equation. But when one looks at the variables that you feed into it, they're very easy to get, which is very useful. But these are very basic things, age, gender, EGFR, and ACR. That's probably some of the power of the KFRE. And yet it's quite basic in terms of what we feed into it. And of course, in diabetes, we mentally add in glycemic and blood pressure control. But importantly, we typically don't use even histology because we don't biopsy a lot of our patients. And therefore, since we don't have a lot of tissue, uh, we don't actually have any of that molecular signature, that gene expression profiling uh, to any extent. And so in nephrology, I feel like we often um, feel left out. We look into the distance and that's where our colleagues are, our oncology colleagues, our cardiology colleagues. They've taken technologies and are way, sailing out into the distance and we're standing on the shore wishing we were there. And so the question is, how did oncology get here? And I think there's many different reasons how they got to the stage they're at versus uh, the way we're at. The primary thing being that they have all access to a lot of tissue. But the other thing is that there are groups of people that are, have been working um, together, uh, breaking down silos to push the science forward to bring this to clinical medicine. First of all, you have a very motivated community of patients that are organized by um, charitable organizations uh, that help inform the most important uh, questions that need to be uh, performed. We have the oncologists who are taking care of these patients who are interacting with the pathologists who have access to the tumor tissue, and then scientists who have the very advanced technologies that can look at these different genes. And importantly, they're all talking together to be able to try to answer these important questions and have led to these, uh, this revolution in understanding. And so the, the, the simple question that we had back in uh, 2017 was, could we take an oncology-like approach to diabetic kidney disease? And so we asked ourselves, do we have that same information um, or at least some of that information like the oncologist said. Well, we have a very, very nice clinical metric of uh, kidney disease, which is EGFR. And we can measure EGFR over time because we, have, uh, we live in Canada with a single payer healthcare system. It's quite easy to track 
EGFR of a patient after um, their biopsy. So we worked with uh, my colleagues in the St. Michael's Hospital Nephrology Division to be able to track people after their um, um, biopsy, whether or not they had slow, moderate, or rapid rate of progression. We recognize that we had, well, not a lot of uh, biopsies, like there's a lot of tumors in the pathology department, but we do have biopsies of diabetic kidney disease in our pathology department. And so we worked with a, um, a very uh, talented pathologist, Adriana Krizova, um, to characterize these uh, biopsies in a standardized fashion histologically. And then the final piece of the puzzle was a scientist with the expertise to do gene expression profiling of these archived formalin fixed biopsies. And his uh, name was Jeff Rana. And of course you need money. So we were, uh, we were provided with a important uh, funding from the BBDC in Toronto uh, to, to look at this. And so we started off with um, a pretty, what I think is modest, uh, 50 diabetic kidney disease biopsies and 14 healthy living donor control biopsies, which ultimately to our surprise turned out to be the largest diabetic kidney disease cohort study to date with all this information. So others have done this uh, in smaller groups of diabetic disease patients, but they're primarily driven just by scientists alone who um, had access to these um, RNA sequencing or microarray technologies. And the result of this is basically a very long list of genes. If you've ever looked at this type of data, you can get 14,000 different genes, whether they're up or they're down, and you have your patients. So the patients would be on the y-axis here, and then all the different genes are on the x-axis. And it's basically an interminable list that's often difficult to interpret if you don't have the other important information to put this into context. And so this is where that oncology approach where we break down the silos and have a group of people, the scientist working with the histologist and working with the clinician scientists like myself and our clinicians, we could inform that list to be able to start understanding what uh, is actually happening in our biopsies. So the first question we had was a very modest one. We wanted to just ask what genes tend to be up regulated or down regulated in diabetic kidney disease. And this has been done before it, to some extent. And I'm not gonna go through all the details, but what Paresh found was that you can take those 14,000 genes and you can categorize them into different types of disease processes. So inflammation is one of them. And what he found was there were many genes that will be associated with inflammatory processes like lymphocyte activation, regulation of cytokine production that were upregulated in diabetic kidney disease. The other thing he found, uh, perhaps not surprisingly, is that fibrosis um, genes were also upregulated. And that's not surprising, that has been done before. And so we can look at those same genes and look at publicly available um, data sets from these other cohorts of diabetes patients that have been studied uh, and look at their kidney uh, signatures. And we found those same genes, those same inflammatory and fibrosis genes are upregulated in these other published cohorts, which we felt was a good validation um, of our platform. When we looked at the downregulated genes, we found something um, different, which is that genes that are involved in cell growth and differentiation uh, and cell metabolism are downregulated. And again, that's not surprising. If you go through the literature in diabetic kidney disease, uh, there's a lot of evidence now that there is dysregulated metabolism, not only systemically, but locally within the kidney. Uh, and uh, there's a, not a lot of growth, uh, um, sorry, not a lot of, uh, uh, there's a lot of uh, cell death in the setting of diabetic kidney disease. The, the kidney grows, but in the setting of later stage disease, uh, there's often some tubular cell apoptosis. So again, these same genes, these growth and metabolism genes uh, were also downregulated in other publicly available diabetes cohorts. So again, I think a nice validation of our system. Um, so, you know, <laughs> with research, as I think uh, many of you know, you, you go down a path and you think you're gonna go down one path and we were going down this conventional path. And yet we reached a fork in the road uh, because we made, or Paresh made, an interesting and completely unexpected observation that made us take a turn to the left, um, not where we planned on going, uh, but I think it led to something that was um, something that we never expected. And, and what did he do? So um, uh, many of you might be familiar with principal component analysis. That's basically where, and I'm not a statistician, so you can, you can uh, correct if I'm wrong, but essentially I think of it as a computer algorithm. You tell the computer to cluster patients based on their characteristics in a completely unbiased fashion. You don't give them any other information except for a specific set of information. And so in this case, we're giving the, uh, the computer the transcriptional information, those 14,000 genes upregulated and downregulated in each of the kidney biopsies. So each dot here represents a single biopsy. And we asked the computer, do 
well, does one patient here in this red circle here look like any other patient? And if they're closer together on this UMAP, you'll, you'll, um, the computer's saying that these patients look more similar uh, and are different from these uh, patients in blue or green. And so the first thing we found, not surprisingly, is that the healthy living donor patients, these are patients who were biopsied for um, potential uh, donation of a living donor kidney, but maybe they had microscopic hematuria, but then on pathology, they were found to have no pathologic abnormalities. They looked very different than the patients with diabetic kidney disease. That's not a surprise and I think is, um, is reassuring. What was surprising and had never been described before is that the diabetes patients, while they were different from the healthy living donor controls, they also segregated into two very different groups. The computer said that these green patients here were very different than the blue patients. And that had never been described before. So we labeled this diabetes A and diabetes B. And so this is the first evidence that they're actually different molecular subtypes of diabetic kidney disease. And so when Suresh and I talked about it, we said, okay, are there obvious clinical differences or demographic differences that could explain this? And so this is our first analysis and there's more that um, I don't have time to show, but the things that you might want us to look at. So with the age, the mean age was no different between two, the two groups. Um, there maybe were slightly more females in diabetes A versus diabetes B, but this was not significant. Um, uh, we did actually, and I apologize, Sean and Maylin, I told you uh, in a previous meeting that we didn't have medications, but I subsequently realized that we did. So we had whether or not they were on a statin, whether or not they were on insulin, or whether or not they were on a RAS blocker at the time of the biopsy. We don't know their doses, but we know whether or not they were on it. And again, there are roughly similar percentages of patients on all of these three classes of drugs. And of course, type 1 diabetes is very different than type 2 diabetes. So we wondered whether or not we were getting a disproportionate enrichment of type 1 in one group or the other, but it seemed that 10% um, of uh, patients were uh, type 1 in, in both groups. So there was no obvious uh, clinical difference based on these characteristics. We then asked Adrienne, uh, so sorry, we then looked at um, the uh, EGFR and ACR of our patients, and we asked whether or not the baseline function was different. And we found despite some outliers that there was no statistically significant difference between baseline function at the time of the biopsy, baseline urine ACR at the time of the biopsy, and then glycemic control uh, to the extent that we could look at it with A1C, with the closest A1C to the biopsy, there was no uh, difference as well. Uh, we then asked Adriana, our pathology co um, colleague, to look at the um, kidney biopsies. Um, and um, I don't have the uh, full data here uh, for sake of time, but we use the Renal Pathology Society classification system as a standardized way of looking at diabetic kidney disease. And I present to you two of the most important ones, I think glomerular injury and the presence of uh, fibrosis or tubular atrophy. And again, there was no obvious difference between the two groups. Um, all the other histologic variables, vascular variables, uh, for example, um, were, were no different between the two groups. So that was interesting. We cannot distinguish these two groups at all, except when we look at their transcriptional profiles. So one of the questions was, uh, well, do they behave differently in terms of their activity? Meaning, do they lose kidney function more or less if you're in diabetes A versus diabetes B? And maybe to my disappointment, <laughs> because I was hoping that the, well, we would identify a high-risk group, um, there was no difference in terms of EGFR slope uh, in diabetes A and diabetes B after their biopsy. And we had a minimum of six months of follow-up, although the mean follow-up was in um, the several year range. So these groups do not look different at all in terms of what they look like at baseline or what happens to their GFR over time post-biopsy, uh, but they are clearly different from a transcriptional perspective. And that was interesting, but perhaps when you take a step back, um, it's probably not that um, um, surprising in that we've known that clinical subtypes of diabetic kidney disease have been well described. Histologically, Paolo Fioretto back in 1996 had already described uh, patients that not only had the classic kimmelstein wilson nodule appearance, uh, but also people can look almost completely normal or they can have a predominantly tubular interstitial fibrosis uh, pattern. And then clinically, we all know there are some people who can progress slowly, more, fat, more quickly, or very rapidly. So we know that subtypes of diabetic kidney disease have been well described, although clearly our molecular subtypes do not explain these different clinical subtypes, but we know that diabetes is not um, one type of disease. Importantly, the molecular processes underlying these different subtypes are poorly understood. And so we're hoping that our um, transcriptional profiling may in fact um, help us figure this out. 
So we went into this a little bit more and asked ourselves, what is different between diabetes A and diabetes B, um, if they really are um, two different groups? Uh, and so um, this is a volcano plot where Paratius basically looked to see, are there genes that are enriched in diabetes A or genes that are enriched in the diabetes B group? And so it's a lot of uh, data on this screen, but um, I'm just gonna draw your attention to this line of zero here. So anything to the right of this line are genes that are enriched in the diabetes A group, and anything to the left of this line are enriched in the diabetes B group, okay? And so you can, cut the, you can define statistically what you think is a significant increase, but I think even visually you can see that there's a huge overrepresentation of genes that are enriched in diabetes A. And so that was really interesting to us. There were a few genes that were enriched in diabetes B, but there was a huge list of genes that are enriched in diabetes A, suggesting that diabetes A is a pretty unique group of patients. And so you can create a gene score when you combine these genes together. Um, and we say that's a gene score that's representative of diabetes A. And you can do the same thing for, uh, to create a gene score that's representative of diabetes B. And we asked in the publicly available data sets, um, what do the publicly available data sets look like? Do they look like diabetes A or diabetes B? And it's a complex and busy graph, and I unfortunately cannot give you a more simpler version of this, but looking at the different publicly available data sets, and you see the blue bars are the gene score associated with diabetes B, and the red bars are the gene scores associated with diabetes A. And the bottom line I want to get across is that the blue bars are generally higher than the red bars. And what this tells us is that most of the other studied populations look like diabetes group B. So diabetes A, for whatever reason, it, we identified in St. Mike's as not something that is clearly um, represented to a great degree in these other cohorts. Um, and it's a group of uh, patients that have all these other genes that are not expressed in diabetes B at all. It's a very interesting group. So whenever one has a group uh, a data um, that is different than other people's data, you first of all wonder, is this a fluke or is this a technical artifact? And so we spent a lot of time, or Prey spent a lot of time trying to figure this out. And so to ask whether or not this is a statistical fluke, well, I mean, we don't have a clear answer to this because we still only have a small group of patients, but 40% of our patients were group A. So it's not as if um, it was a very small number of patients. We also wondered if it was an error effect. Was it a different um, pathology technician or a different radiologist doing the biopsies? So they're getting biopsies in a different way or processing them in a different way. And it didn't matter what the, the, the error was the same uh, for diabetes A and diabetes B. It was not that diabetes A patients were all biopsied in the 1990s and diabetes B were all biopsied in the 2000s. Uh, and there has been no changes in the way the biopsies are processed. The pathology techs, um, I, I guess they like to work at St. Mike's, have not changed over the last uh, 15 years. So we don't think it's that. We also wondered whether or not it was uh, the fact that we isolated more glomerular um, um, uh, tissue uh, in diabetes A or diabetes B, but we found when we went back and looked at the pathology reports that there were equal number of glomeruli that were in each of the biopsies. So we can't think of an obvious explanation, although be open to your suggestions, to explain why technically this could just be an explanation for why diabetes A um, exists. And so we had to confront the possibility that maybe this is an actual real biologic um, finding. And, and the only thing we can explain is why this is not as well seen in other cohorts is that we are the largest cohort to my surprise of 50 patients to date. And, and so maybe it's just that people didn't have enough patients in these cohorts to be able to identify them. And there were some patients in these groups that did look a little like diabetes um, A, uh, as you can see here. So maybe um, that's the case, although still we're a little worried about that. Okay, so, but if we take um, this assumption that diabetes A actually is a true biologic disease phenotype or a molecular subtype, we can ask ourselves, of those 14,000 genes that are enriched in diabetes A, what are common gene programs that are activated? And so for this, we took a different approach. Um, we recognize that genes need to be turned on by transcription factors. You'll remember from medical school and undergrad that every gene gets expressed when a transcription factor uh, that's specific for the promoter of that gene sits on that promoter and tells that um, the RNA polymerase to transcribe that gene, okay? So we know through lots of other work from other people um, what transcription factors exist and what genes they control. So we can take a look at these genes and we can categorize those genes as saying these genes are turned on by a transcription factor, let's say HIF1-alpha. This gene uh, is turned on by another transcription factor um, like uh, CDX2. Uh, and so we asked 
the program, the computer, to say, okay, if we assume that these genes are turned on, what transcription factors would we expect um, to be uh, the ones that are responsible? We came up with a, a number of very interesting transcription factors, but I'm going to give you one example for the sake of time, and that's CDX2. Okay, so when we looked at these genes here, um, statistically, um, we found that these genes would be very likely to be turned on by transcription factor CDX2, which is an interesting transcription factor, which has not been really well described in kidney disease at all, not in diabetes, but more is involved in intestinal development in epithelial cells. And so we then asked, okay, well, if CDX2 is likely turning on these genes, well, we should see that it is overexpressed in diabetes A. And in fact, that's what we found. When we looked at the expression of CDX2 in diabetes A, it was not present really in the healthy living donors, was almost absent in diabetes B, but was clearly uh, upregulated in diabetes A, which we think is really exciting because it suggests that maybe this transcriptional factor approach will identify some really important genes that if we can turn off, maybe we can uh, influence um, the, the progression of diabetes A. Okay, so um, as an interim summary so far, um, this is where we're at to date. It appears that we've identified a novel but common molecular subtype of diabetes, diabetes A, if you believe our, our findings. Um, diabetes B is more representative of previous diabetes cohorts. And in fact, more than half of our patients were diabetes B. But importantly, when you look at these patients in the clinic, we have no uh, parameter that can distinguish between these two patients groups at all. So what are we gonna do now? So the next steps are that we wanna make sure that the genes that we think are unique to diabetes A are in fact expressed. So an example, CDX2 that I showed you. And uh, we're very actively investigating these key genes that we think are upregulating diabetes A. Again, as an example, CDX2, but there are others that we think might identify new targets for therapy. So whereas the diabetes A and diabetes B don't look any different and they don't progress any differently, maybe diabetes A progresses because of a different set of genes than diabetes B, and we can take advantage of our findings to be able to develop targets, targeted therapy for diabetes A. And so the idea here is that we want to find the equivalent of HER2 or the equivalent of the hormone receptors that occur for breast cancer that can allow us to specifically target diabetes A pathogenesis. And before you say that's a pie in the sky idea, we've already been able to do this through a separate project where we've been profiling transcriptional to a transcriptional profiling of transplant biopsies. And that has identified three key genes, YAP, TAS, and NUAC, that other members of my lab who have been not involved um, in the cancer of CKD directly, but more peripherally, and they've gone on to show that they're actually very important for fibrosis of the kidney, but also of other organs, and we've identified drugs, um, early stage drugs that can target these, and we can show that we can block fibrosis and uh, organ dysfunction. And now we're working with pharmaceutical companies um, to develop those drugs for human trial. Okay, so I said uh, to you that we went um, to this fork in the road and we took a turn to the left because of this interesting observation. Uh, Paresh also was working on the more conventional right-sided um, of the road, uh, what we had initially planned on doing. And that was the idea of stage versus activity because as I said to you before, I think we sometimes, or at least I do, conflate the two together. But if we start thinking about those two separately, maybe we can actually understand a little bit more about diabetes in the kidney. So let's talk a little bit about stage. That's how close we are to the edge of the cliff. Are there genes that associate with stage of disease? And so we define stage in two different ways. One is the baseline function. So this is the function, the EGFR you are at just about the time of the biopsy. Uh, and there were genes, you remember there's 14,000 of these genes, we can plot the gene expression for each of those genes and look at um, the GFR of the patients, uh, of each of those patients. So each dot represents a patient here. And you can see we found some genes whose expression as it increased was associated with a more uh, lower GF baseline GFR. And you can calculate a correlation coefficient for this. Similarly, we figured if you have fibrosis, that's also probably irreversible, that's irreversible disease, so probably represents stage of disease as well. And we found that there were some genes that um, whose expression correlated with increasing fibrosis on that biopsy when Adriana read it. And again, you can calculate the correlation coefficient for this. So you can calculate 14,000 correlation coefficients for the relationship between gene expression and fibrosis, and another 14,000 correlation coefficients for the relationship to baseline GFR. So you have 28,000 data points. How do you understand that or go through that data? Well, I'm a visual person, so we decided to do this um, by plotting in a two-dimensional plot the correlation coefficients. 
So this is not so easy to wrap your mind around, but um, if you think about plotting the correlation coefficients, um, here um, it, on the x-axis is the correlation with baseline GFR. So anything to the left of this line is a negative correlation coefficient. And what that means in my mind is as the gene expression goes up, baseline GFR goes down. So in this case, each dot is a gene. That's why there's 14,000 of these genes. And so if you're left of this line, you tend to be expressed as a gene when the GFR is lower, okay? The second thing you can do is you plot on the y-axis correlation coefficient with fibrosis score. And so here, if you're above this line, gene expression goes up, fibrosis goes up. So it's this top left-hand quadrant that we're particularly interested in. These are genes that are upregulated in fibrotic kidneys and kidneys with low baseline GFR. So it allowed us to take the 14,000 genes and focus in on a quarter of them. And then in particular, you can set a very high and stringent standard to look at the very top left corner. And Parish has identified the identity of some of those genes here. And so if you look at that in a table format, there are a whole bunch of genes that associate with what I call late stage DKD, people who have fibrotic kidneys and people who have uh, low baseline GFR. And there, you know, we're investigating these right now. And then maybe some of these uh, for you are some of your favorite genes are listed here. Uh, what about disease activity? Well, that's how fast we are walking towards the edge. Um, and you can do the same thing. You can look at eGFR slope and its correlation, co correlation with any uh, of the 14,000 genes. I give you one example of NUB1, where as NUB1 expression goes up, it tend, you tend to have a more negative GFR slope. So it tends to be present um, in high levels in people who are going to lose kidney function. And so we did this in both diabetes A and in diabetes B. And so here I uh, ask uh, Paresh to plot the correlation coefficients um, for um, uh, the eGFR slope in group A uh, versus the eGFR slope in group B. And so you can draw those quadrants again. And if you look to the left of this line, these are genes that as their expression goes up, you have faster eGFR loss in diabetes A. And again, if you go to the um, below this line, as gene expression goes to the uh, goes up, you have faster eGFR lo GFR loss in group B. So this is a way for us to categorize this 14,000 genes into genes that are associated with more rapid eGFR decline. And again, if you look at the very bottom left-hand corner, you get the identity of some of the genes here. Uh, and these are the ones presented here. And uh, here's the number one that I presented to you before. So we're actively investigating some of these genes as well to see if there are actual genes that we think are not just associated with progression, but actually are causative. Um, now, what you can also do is combine these genes into a single score, called a, what would you call a disease activity gene score, and see how that disease activity gene score predicts um, GFR loss. And so you can see here, when we create that gene score, um, it's quite predictive of a rapid decline in GFR slope um, in both diabetes A and diabetes B. And so um, we think that uh, um, the disease activity gene score can actually identify patients who are at risk of rapid eGFR loss. So here, um, Paresh has plotted their survival, um, renal, free, uh, renal death free survival. So this is survival without um, dying, without going on to dialysis or transplantation. So it's control, uh, that's number one. We control for baseline GFR because we don't want to uh, conflate the idea of someone standing at this place versus someone standing here. So we're only looking um, at the, uh, whether or not the disease activity gene score can then predict whether or not you're going to go on to develop dialysis, a need for dialysis or transplantation. And so we can do this um, in, a, in a more continuous way, or we can just do a binary above the median gene score and below the median gene score. And if you do it that way, you can see there's a nice separation uh, between those who have a better score versus those who have a uh, poorer score. Um, and we think that this actually provides additive prognostic value. So we try to put ourselves in the clinician's shoes. So when you see a patient referred to initially with diabetic kidney disease, you will probably have some eGFR data points prior to the referral, uh, and you can calculate a slope. Uh, and you can use that to somewhat predict what's going to happen in the future. And uh, that's what we call the pre-biopsy eGFR slope in our patients. And again, if you plot um, the rate of eGFR, so rate of renal death-free survival, you can see that that's somewhat predictive of whether or not you're going to go on to develop renal failure. Again, if you're above the median here, you're going to be better. If you're below the mean, you're going to be worse. 
but it's not that predictive. It's not so good at predicting if you're going to go on to develop kidney failure or not. But when you add on uh, the uh, gene or disease activity score, um, you get better discrimination. So here in the red and the blue, you can see they are completely overlapping. This is if your e pre-biopsy EGFR slope is above the median and you have a um, good gene score. You can see that um, they do relatively well. And similarly, um, if your um, EGFR slope before the uh, biopsy is below the median, so it's kind of a bad prognostic factor, you would have been categorized here, but you had a good gene score, that brings you back up to having um, a good slope and a good gene score, okay? Um, this is where it gets interesting. When you have a gene score that's bad, that doesn't matter if you have a good slope, you can already start to get a stepwise decline. So here's the one where you have um, a good slope, but you have a bad gene score. And then when you have both bad, you have a very rapid decline. So we think that this might have additive prognostic value on top of the clinical variables that uh, we have. In this case, we've just cor um, corrected for baseline GFR, um, and we also are able to look at pre-biopsy EGFR slope. So in summary, um, I hope I've shown you that we found that different genes are associated with disease stage versus disease activity, which is something that I had not thought about before uh, this project. And um, we're investigating these genes to see if they're actually associated with disease um, uh, pathogenesis, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to come back to you and present some of that data later on. So far, what we've done is we've combined the gene, um, the high disease activity gene score uh, genes into a single gene score that you can use. And so if you have those um, genes, you can calculate that score. And we think that that has added a value in identifying patients who are at higher risk of renal death, even when you control for baseline GFR at the time that you see them. So what are our next steps? Well, we think we've only um, really scratched the tip of the iceberg. Uh, the first thing we need to do, of course, is we need to validate this disease activity gene score in a separate independent cohort. This may be just a feature of our own uh, cohort, um, and it's a small cohort. So this is um, a, a really important goal. The second thing is we had a small cohort, even though it's the biggest one to date. So we were only able to control for baseline GFR, uh, but we'd really like to control for other important variables that you always use um, at... Um, um, at presentation, which is, of course, all the other things that are used in the KFRE. And importantly, our pathology department doesn't just contain diabetic kidney disease biopsies. In fact, it preferentially does not because we don't generally biopsy diabetes. And so we think that we can perform similar analyses on other kidney diseases, and we're now embarking on studying ankylvasculitis um, and also um, lupus nephritis. And our end goal is to um, basically recreate the thing that oncologists have where we replace breast cancer with kidney disease. And we'll be able to identify different molecular subtypes that inform prognosis, but also more importantly, uh, inform therapy. And to do this, as I said before, we need to have a larger independent cohort of patients. And so this is where cancel of CKD was extremely important. It's allowing us to build a national kidney disease biobank where like-minded investigators are contributing their biopsies um, for this purpose. And so I'd like to highlight Sean Barber and Mei Lin and Paula, uh, who are here in, uh, in BC, who are uh, providing biopsies so far. Sorry, I can't see it. it they've provided up to 50 biopsies um, for us, and we've already received them, are sequencing them now. We have all the close associated clinical data. Manitoba is uh, slowly coming online with the help of Claudia Regato and Ian Gibson. Uh, I've already mentioned to you Adriana Krizova here at St. Michael's with our own 50 biopsies St. Mike's, and Kevin Burns has provided 30 biopsies to date um, from Ottawa Hospital. And we're currently in some very exciting discussions with Justin Chun and Daniel Maruve in Calgary to take advantage of their target KD biobank uh, that is very similarly uh, oriented. And so hopefully we're going to have hundreds of diabetic kidney disease biopsies and thousands of kidney disease biopsies in general for us to investigate. And as I mentioned to you before, this is truly a team effort. We would not be here if we did not have funding and support from the CanSolve CKD network. Um, I didn't have a chance to mention at the beginning, but I'd like to highlight specifically our patient partners, Mary Bocage, Dwight, and Gwen, who have been involved in the process from the very beginning, helping us decide what are the most important questions we should be asking with these resources and technologies that we have. And so I'd really like to thank them for, for their input because they're doing this on a purely volunteer basis. As I mentioned to you before, there are many investigators who have been involved in this study, so I'm really just a representative of, of this group. Um, I've highlighted that uh, Paresh um, has uh, done most of this work, but really there have actually been a huge number of, of trainees and uh, young scientists 
um, who I uh, view as the next generation who will be able to replace us um, to, to um, come up with the next new discoveries. And as I mentioned, there are a few members in my lab who have been peripherally involved and used the um, kind of strategies that we've had with the diabetes cohort in our transplant biopsies, uh, Xiaolin and Julian. And there are many other people in my lab who have been involved in, and I won't go through them in detail for time purposes, um, but uh, they've been uh, very instrumental. So I'd like to thank them. Uh, so thank you. And I'm happy to take any questions. Hopefully I left some time. Yeah, great. Thank you, Darren. And thank us, uh, you and your teams um, to come into the 21st or maybe hopefully the 22nd century with a more sophisticated approach to diabetes. Uh, Sean put in the chat because he uh, long question. If you don't see a difference in the clinical outcome, like GFR slope, in what you showed at the beginning in DKA and B, is it reasonable to suppose that modifying the gene expression in A will alter the kidney outcome? Can you actually see if you restrict the analysis to only the A group, whether it correlates? I think you showed that at the end. I think that question was what you actually ended up showing that he put in beforehand. Is that right? That within okay. group A, there is that you can differentiate based on the gene signature. Yeah, I think so. Uh, so, so there, so, so definitely you can, you can definitely identify. So genes that associate with diabetes A don't necessarily um, uh, uh, um, alter kidney outcome or correlate with kidney outcome, but we can look within A and B and identify genes that more specifically that associate with slope. And so those are the genes that we're going to be trying to target um, exactly as you said, um, Adira, to potentially alter outcome. Now, of course, some of these might be epiphenomena, like they're associated but not causative, and, and some of them are causative. And the, now the big question is, which ones should we focus on? Raise their hands and Brenda can, um, can uh, I think there's a uh, question. Yeah. Uh, so there was one question about um, uh, from Abdul Hamid Ramadan, who, who mentioned that antifibrosis medications have failed to stop progression of CKD and other organ fibrosis like lung and liver. So, uh, so I guess that relates to the the comment that I made about um, developing antifibrotic drugs. Um, right. So, so yeah, for sure. So I think. Um, Partly, I'd say that uh, fibrosis is very poorly understood, like diabetes. So um, the drugs that we have uh, um, available to us, perfenidone and, 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 and nindotanib, they're, they're really not that great drugs. They were not designed, actually, as antifibrotic drugs to start off with. Uh, nindotanib was an anti-cancer drug, and so, so the thought was that it might be beneficial. Um, so number one. Number two, uh, we've we've been horrible at testing antifibrotic drugs in, in CKD. Yes. Uh, so I think that the, that question is, remains open, um, uh, I'd say, um, rather than to say that it hasn't uh, yet. I guess one of the questions I also have as a corollary to that is it, and you were sort of alluding to this, but there may be different time points in people's trajectory where different genes are turned on or off or upregulated. And you might think about a more nuanced you give at an earlier or at a stage of, you know, gene upregulation of ABC versus DEF, and then think about that much as they do in cancer or other diseases where you have a stepwise difference or change in your drugs. I mean, I guess that would require serial biopsies and to see if different things are expressed at different points in time. Yeah, exactly. So, and this is a, um, where, where, again, um, as I mentioned before, there's lots of um, reasons why cancer is ahead of us. And I, so I oversimplified things, but they, they have an overabundance of tissue. Uh, and so that's the, that's a, a big plus that they have. They can often have serial samples and also they have many more uh, samples. So that's number one. Number two uh, is uh, we can, I think, do this. It won't be as easy because we likely won't have serial biopsies, but we have, we can identify patients at different stages of disease. We didn't have enough patience to do that, but the, the thought that we had was, you know, now when we're going to be expanding by twofold, maybe we can start um, grouping patients into different stages of disease and then seeing whether or not there are different genes that are turned on that are associated with disease activity. Uh, mm -hmm. And then, as you say, do more stage specific treatment. And I guess you're going to do this, but I mean, the trans their group of people in whom you could look at their biopsies. Um, and see if you see similar signatures or not, and what the impact of, it gets com com complicated, right? Because they're on other drugs that might modify some genes as well. But you know, no, all, nonetheless, to say that it's uh, interesting and exciting to be able to go to this next level of uh, tissue-based inquiry. 
Uh, yeah, completely. Yeah, I'm. I'm. I uh, people are more than happy to answer, uh, ask more questions. But I'll, yeah, I'll definitely address that one too. I'd say that um, it's interesting. So we have been doing transplant and diabetes uh, biopsy analyses in in parallel, and the transplant data came out first because what was very interesting is the transplant biopsies were much uh, cleaner and they were a much more homogeneous population. And I think it relates to the fact that in transplant, we are um, hyper biopsying. <laughs> so anybody who has any evidence of uh, um, allograft dysfunction or albuminuria, we're gonna biopsy them. Whereas in diabetes, um, it's a much more slowly progressive disease. They may not come to the nephrologist's attention. And second and thirdly, we often don't biopsy them. So um, it was a very heterogeneous group of patients. And so we were able to come up with some really screaming signals with 18 transplant biopsies. And, and we had to work a lot harder in the 50 diabetes biopsies to find signals that were not as um, you know hot, I guess is what I'd say. So that's why, one of the problems, I think. Great. Questions or thoughts? You can raise your hand or put a question. Um, so I think Dan, Dan Schwartz, it's good to, good okay. to hear from you, Dan. Um, so finerenone is proposed to have effects on inflammation and fibrosis. Do you think that's true? Any idea on impact of medication gene expression? Yeah, so uh, very interesting about these new mineralic corticoid um, uh, antagonists. Um, yeah, I think it's it's been uh, well known uh, for a while that mineralocorticoids are, are pro-inflammatory and pro-fibrotic. Um, so presumably finerenone is 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 going to be blocking that, and presumably well have anti-inflammatory and anti-fibrotic effects. Um, I've never um, never been able to look at the effect of uh, this medication on gene expression because we haven't had many patients on that. Um, uh, but to be very interested to, to look at that. So I guess I, I actually when Finer when they were doing the Fidelio and Figaro studies, I I met with Bayer to ask them whether or not I could have access to some of their biopsies to study this. But they were um, I think a, a little worried at the time because they were doing the study, so they didn't actually uh, want to share their their biopsies at the time. But uh, uh, maybe now um, they would be. So good idea, Dan. Right, and there's another question in the chat. Um, thinking more about morphology, I think this is May Lin. Um, the RPS scores at inflammation either as part of IFTA or outside of IFTA. We often see IFTA with inflammation, but we also see some biopsies with dense inflammation in the areas of IFTA. And if IFTA is now part of transplant analysis, I wonder if it plays a role in the progression of IFTA and chronicity in native disease as well. Yeah, that's that's a great question, Maylin. I think um, um, the, the this concept of I IFTA is, I think, uh, likely to be very, very important. And uh, you know, we typically do not think of diabetic nephropathy, at least clinically, as an inflammatory disease. But there's a lot of evidence that there is inflammation that's driving this. And so it very well may be that you know, IIFTA is a particularly um, bad, um, a bad um, prognostic thing. Yeah, that's a very good question. We've not looked. Um, and then, as you mentioned, in our, the RPS classification, we wouldn't have captured that at all. So we should go back and look. Yeah, well, that's great. Well, we're five minutes to the bottom of the hour. I don't see any more questions. Um, thanks very much for making the time for uh, promoting um, your junior staff and, uh, and Parash in particular for allowing him to go down different pathways and explore things. But uh, I think more importantly, I, it's great to see Canadian nephrology uh, teams contributing to our understanding. So, so thanks so much. And hopefully we've stimulated lots of thought and enthusiasm for both the value uh, scientifically as well as ultimately clinically of biopsying. So thanks again, Darren, and thanks everyone Thank you. for your participation. Thank you so much, everybody. Great. Thanks. Bye. Okay. Bye now.